Good afternoon, everyone, or morning. I guess I'm a, we're across different time zones here. Erica, where are you at today? I'm in South Florida, so Eastern time. You are. I actually just left Florida. I moved to the, the north coast of things to escape. Nice. The <laughs> well, it's finally getting nice down here, although there's a big storm coming through if you're on the Gulf Coast. So any Floridians, stay safe with the storm. Yes, everybody get ready with your hurricane prep. I heard that's just around the corner. So everyone stay safe and <laughs> don't wait too long if you have to evacuate so you don't get stuck on 75. Yep, for sure. Awesome. We'll give it just a minute for everyone to hop on. If people want to drop in their chat where they're logging in from today, I'm always so curious since we've got Erica and I on different sides of the country. I'm in Minnesota, so as far as you can go, I think it's in the continental U.S., but let's see where we got people coming in from. Ooh, Tampa, stay safe with the storm. <laughs> we've got all over the country. That's great. Washington, California, Louisiana. My goodness, it looks like we might hit every state in this webinar. That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you're enjoying fall. And for my Floridians as a form formerly former Floridian, I hope you guys are making it through hurricane season well and surviving the heat. I know it's brutal this time of year. I think we're starting to slow down, so we'll go ahead and get started so we can get to everything today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danny Clough. I'm the channel marketing coordinator over here on the QGIVE team, and I'm really excited to welcome Erica Liguanti from Achieve today, who's going to be sharing tips on how you can supercharge your year-end fundraising for a record-breaking Giving Tuesday. Um, if you've been following the QGIVE webinars for a while, you might have had the opportunity to hear her speak before, so you might just be as excited as I am today. Um, as a reminder for all of you who keep up with your CFRE credential, today's webinar is eligible for one credit of continuing education, so make sure you're getting that down on your yearly tracker. As a reminder, today's webinar will be recorded, so tomorrow afternoon you'll be receiving an email with the link to the recording and the slides, as well as a few additional free resources to help you on your fundraising journey. As we go through the webinar today, feel free to use the chat to talk with Erica and I, as well as your peers who are on the webinar today. And if you have any questions, you can actually add those into the Q&A area of Zoom, and then we'll try and get to those at the end of today's session. And for those of you who may not be familiar, earlier this year, QGIVE did join the Bloomerang team to offer a modern giving platform that puts relationships at the heart of fundraising. This combined solution unifies your donors' activities, giving you the power to acquire new donors, cultivate impactful relationships, and maximize the potential of your donor communities. We're super excited about what this opportunity means for all of you. So if you have any questions, whether you're a Bloomerang customer, a QGIVE customer, or not, either of our customers yet, please reach out. We'd love to tell you how, what this means for you and your organization. And then of course, I'm always excited to refer all of you to our wonderful partner network. One of those of course being Achieve, who we've worked with for a while now. Um, Achieve helps nonprofits investigate, activate, and motivate people for their mission. Um, we have multiple webinars that we've done with Erica, as well as other resources, and I think most recently we just put out the Website Design Best Practices for Nonprofits ebook. That one's super great, and Achieve shares a lot of tips there, so if you haven't checked that out, you can go on the QGIVE website and find that there. And of course, I can't miss the opportunity to introduce Ms. Erica Linguanti. Uh, Erica leads the strategy and execution of all marketing initiatives with Achieve with an emphasis on helping nonprofits tell their story digitally. Um, you have so much expertise to share Erica today and I know a lot of content to share with everyone. So I don't wanna take up too much of your time. So I'll go ahead and hand things over to you. All right, thank you so much, Danny, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. As Danny mentioned, we have a lot to cover today, uh, so I'll go through um, as much as I can. But of course, if you have questions, please drop them in the comments. We're happy to get to them at the end. Um, or I'll go ahead and drop my email right now. If you want to ask any questions directly, feel free to email me during or after the session. Uh, but I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. All right, can you see my screen okay, everyone? 
Yeah. All right. So today we're going to talk about Giving Tuesday and how to position that as part of your year end giving effort. Um, so if this is your face when your team mentions Giving Tuesday or if you're, um, you know, just don't want to deal with it, you feel like there's too much competition on Giving Tuesday, you know, it's, it's such a pain. Um, maybe we just need to try some new strategies. So I'm here to help today. Um, today we're going to talk about why you shouldn't give up on Giving Tuesday. We'll talk about how to position Giving Tuesday. Uh, hint, hint, I think it's best when you put it in your overall year-end strategy instead of just banking on the one 24-hour day to cure all that ails you in the fundraising world. Uh, so we'll talk about how to do that. Um, we'll also examine ways to amplify your message and make sure we're reaching supporters through your year-end strategy, but a lot of these recommendations also apply year-round, so you might get some good ideas uh, as you start planning for 2025. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about how to know what's working and decide where to place your efforts. You know, we're all busy nonprofit fundraising professionals and marketing professionals. Um, it's always good to understand what's really moving the needle and getting the results, so you can double down on that and stop wasting time on what's not working for you. Um, and then, of course, I want to help. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat, email me. You know, I want to help and, and get you as many answers as I can. So, so we're here to support. Um, so first things first, you know, why shouldn't you give up, give up on Giving Tuesday? Um, I know it, it can be a pain and it's one extra thing you have to work into your, your year-end strategy. Um, but the reality is, is Americans are still participating in this. Last year, over 34 million Americans participated and over $3 billion was raised for U.S. nonprofits on Giving Tuesday. Um, so what does that really mean? It means your supporters are actively giving on Giving Tuesday, um, but you just need to find a way to connect with them and get them to to give to you versus the other organizations uh, that might be competing with uh, with you on Giving Tuesday. So start early. Um, we'll talk about how to position things. Um, so of course, you definitely don't want to miss out on this. People are giving. They want to be, uh, you know, kind and, and giving after the holiday season, during the holiday season. Um, don't miss out on these opportunities. Um, and then I always like this, the future depends on what you do today. So the good news is it's September. Giving Tuesday is not until December 3rd. You have time to work this in. Um, so you're all here. That's a great first step to start your planning. Hopefully you've been brainstorming internally with your team as well. Um, but whatever happens in the future is definitely going to depend on what you do in the coming weeks of your planning. So first, let's talk about how to position Giving Tuesday. Um, I hear a lot when I sit with organizations, you know, they're concerned of do we do Giving Tuesday or do we do our regular year-end fundraising campaign? Um, it's not an either or. I always recommend a both. So you're still going to have your year-end fundraising campaign, but if you want to participate in Giving Tuesday, um, use that as a benchmark and, and a post in your year-end fundraising campaign. Um, so the first thing to do, you know, a lot of people would like to jump to, we're going to do direct mail, we're going to do this tactic, we're going to do that tactic. No. Step one, we just need to develop what's our ask for year-end fundraising. Not even for Giving Tuesday, but just year-end fundraising, what's the ask? So how I like to approach this with my team and the organizations that I work with, the first question is, what's your goal? How much money do you need to raise um, during your year-end fundraising efforts? You know, if you've done some really successful year-end fundraising campaigns from previous years, you know, that's great. You have some benchmark numbers. Um, use that to also take a temperature check. Are your goals realistic? If you raised $5,000 last year on your year-end fundraising efforts, if you set a goal of we want to raise $100,000 this year, that's a great goal and you might be able to hit it, um, but more likely than not, it, it may not happen. So you want to make sure that your goal is realistic. So if you're not sure what your goal should be, take a look at how much you raised during your in fundraising last year and increase it by 10, 15, 20%. Um, that's a good, good starting point. It's always great to exceed your goals. Of course, we always want to raise more money. Um, but it really helps, especially if you have a, a team that's, that's stretched thin, make sure you have a goal, but also make sure that it's realistic. So how much do you need to raise? And is that realistic? Um, the next step is I like to brain dump. You know, it's really easy when you're working at a nonprofit, you're wearing a million hats, you're doing a million things. You know, you know what you're doing at, at the organizational level. Um, but sometimes you forget about the, the big picture. It's a good time to reacquaint with like, what's our mission? Why do we do what we do? So what does your organization do? 
how do you do it? And then what makes your organization unique? In the marketing world, we call that UVP or unique value proposition. Um, there's lots of animal rescues. There's lots of health and human service organizations. There's lots of organizations that help with homelessness, education, all different things. But every organization that I work with, they always have something that's a little bit different. Maybe you focus in youth homelessness for a specific community. Um, that's different than somebody who's uh, working with veteran homelessness, right? Um, so really spend some time really digging in, not just what you do and how you do it, but what's unique about you. Um, what What's something that may differentiate you from other nonprofits and also resonate with your the people that are giving? right? So just spend some time brain dumping. You know what you do, but sometimes when you write it all out, you'll start to find little tidbits that are going to help with your messaging component. And then the next step is you want to pick a path. Do you have an urgent need that requires funding? You know, maybe a grant didn't get renewed. So, oh my gosh, if we want to keep this program going, we need XYZ dollars by end of year to continue that program next year. That's an urgent need. Um, and that maybe that is your messaging for your campaign. Um, or, you know, when you're looking at, you know, what's unique about us, what do we do? How do we do it? You know, do you have a story or a focus that you think will be compelling? A lot of organizations do a lot of things. If you're a legal aid organization, you might be doing everything from, you know, foster care kids all the way to elder care and everything in between. Um, so when you're thinking about your messaging for your end, you don't need to talk about everything that you do, but pick an element of what you do that you can build a story around, you can build a message and an ask around um, that would be compelling. And then lastly, when you're thinking about what path you wanna take, it's also helpful if you can say, is this informed by data or is this based on a punch? So for example, maybe in the past few years, you've done some different year-end fundraising campaigns and you found, hey, when we talk about our children and family programs around the holidays, people give more than when we talk about pick a different program, right? So that's data. You know that that was compelling. Maybe you can build off of that. Um, or maybe it is just a hunch, you know, hey, I, I don't know. We've never done this before, but we know that this is really unique for us. Um, and we, we want to build a story around that. That's okay. But just kind of understand, do you have any data to support why you're going with a certain story or path? Um, and if not, then you need to be transparent about that with your team of this is a test and learn. And maybe you want to test out some different messages before you solidify your campaign, right? Um, and so once you've picked your path, so say we want to raise $30,000 and we know that our the people that give around the holidays, they like when we talk about kids, right? So instead of our ask being, hey, we have this urgent need to raise $30,000, your ask should really be, hey, we want to help 30 more kids succeed in school this year. It's going to be way more compelling. Um, I always tell my team, empathy sustains charity, right? So why do people give? They give because they believe that there's a problem. They believe that your organization's working to solve it and that by supporting you, they are in turn helping to solve a problem. So you really need to invite them into the conversation. If you just say, hey, we want to raise $30,000, great, why? You didn't tell me anything yet, but help me help 30 more kids succeed in school this year. Wow, now I understand you, you need help. And this is what my money is going to do for you, right? Um, so, so make sure you're focusing your message on impact, not money necessarily. So now that you have a clear ask, next step is now you can start creating your campaign timeline. So we're still not getting to the tactics of how are we going to do it, whether that's direct mail or whatever. Um, you, you, you're just setting up the timeline of when are we going to, to be talking about different things? What are we focusing on each month? Um, so how I really like to approach your own fundraising campaigns is I look at a four month timeline starting in September. So the fact that this webinar is in September, great. We're in the creative month. We're still formulating and finalizing our plans. Um, so the fact that you're all here, that's awesome. You're right on schedule. Um, October, that's really going to be your planning month. Hopefully you're going to start to implement some of your messaging as well. You're going to start getting um, the word out of, of what you do, sharing impact from the year, etc. 
Uh, but then as you go into November, it's game on. We need to start fundraising. So this is going to be a month where you're going to start to test and learn uh, different asks, different messages, and, and take everything that you learned in November. So that way, by the time you hit December, that giving month, you're ready to run. Um, and then as a note, Giving Tuesday is December 3rd this year. Thanksgiving's a little bit later. So that means uh, Giving Tuesday falls into December instead of November. That's okay. You're going to use that as a benchmark, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so in terms of how to position Giving Tuesday, so the first thing is, when are you starting your year-end campaign? Are you starting to ask and, and solicit in October? Is it November? Are you not starting until December? I would say December is a little late, um, but up to you. But, but step one, you know, when are you starting your year-end campaign? And then the next question I always like to ask is, how much money do you want to raise by Giving Tuesday? So you have your goal for the year end, let's say it's $30,000, we want to help 30 kids. Um, what's a benchmark? Can you say in your messaging, start thinking about how you can create that urgency of, you know, when you're introducing your campaign, hey, you know, we need your help to, to help 30 kids this year uh, in school. You know, we want to make sure that we've already helped 15 of them by giving Tuesday, right? So you're asking for that urgency. You're trying to hit that halfway mark of your fundraising goal by giving Tuesday. So instead of using giving Tuesday as this one day, 24 hours to raise all the money, ask people to start pledging in advance for giving Tuesday. Hey, will you help us hit this benchmark by giving Tuesday? Um, so that's how I really like to position giving Tuesday as part of the year end. Um, now, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. We already have a ton of really great free resources at AchieveCauses.com. If you go to AchieveCauses.com backslash free tools, there is a year end planning guide that takes you through step by step, September, October, November, December, what should you should be doing, what you should be thinking about, um, strategies to succeed with your year end planning. Um, so the planning guide is really helpful. We also have a planner that goes along with it for 2024. It's a calendar view. You can print it out. It has a checklist, five things to keep in mind, five things to do each week. Um, so it can really keep you on track. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the, the timeline and how to build a campaign because we already have those resources for you. So if you need them, if they would be helpful, please feel free to go download them. Uh, they're there to help you. Um, now, just to kind of give you a high level of what to think about for each month. So we're in September. It's the creative month. This is when you should start uh, coming up with your creative theme. You know, what's your ask? What's your message? What's the type of imagery you need uh, to go with that campaign? Um, this is also a really important time to renew your own understanding of your organization's mission. Again, it's so easy to get caught up in the day to day. You, you sort of forget all the things that you might do as an organization as a whole and what impact you have in the community. So really spend some time thinking about that. Um, if you have the resources, this is also a great time to start surveying your supporters. Hey, what would you like to hear more about? Um, do you want to hear more about impact or more about this program? Um, you know, why, why do you give, right? You can ask your, your board, why do you volunteer? Why is this compelling to you, right? Like ask those questions if you have the resources. Um, but if not, just spend some time really thinking about what your organization does. You know, if you're a team of one, you can still do this. Um, but definitely spend some time thinking about what you do and why because that's going to help with your creative theme and message then as you move into october this is your planning month so if you need to get approval from people on your teams for this you should be presenting your strategy and approach to them getting buy-in um, you should be thinking about the different methods and channels for your multi-channel campaign that you're going to use to seek support um, especially the timing and the intended outcomes of each solicitation so if you're doing a really great campaign some of your early messaging may not be direct ask. If you're reaching out to somebody that hasn't given to you in a while and you know they haven't been contacted in a while, if you hit them right out of the gate with, hey, please donate, we need you, they may not convert, right? But if you hit them with, hey, you know, this, it's been a while, this is what we've been up to, let me tell you this great story. And then a week later, you're following up with another story. Um, by the time you get to December, they're going to be more likely to give to you. Um, now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be asking. You should always have soft asks in your communication. You know, if people want to read through a story and give at the end, amazing. Um, but, but when you're in October, you're presenting your plan or getting buy-in, you know, it's not just thinking about what are you going to be doing, but what's the timing and what outcome do you want? Are you trying to educate somebody? Is that you want them to convert? You want them to give right now? You know, what's the purpose behind each piece of marketing? 
Now in November, this is a great time. If you haven't done it already, I love to start early in October, but if you haven't, November, definitely start putting those year-end story concepts in your newsletters, uh, putting it on social media, presenting different aspects of your campaign to the people uh, who support you. Um, and you're gonna start asking your followers to act on behalf of it, the issues. So this is a great time to start talking about, hey, Giving Tuesday's coming up. You know, we have this big goal for this year. You know, we wanna make sure we're halfway there by Giving Tuesday. Can you help us with that? Um, and in all of your messaging for November, this is a great time to start educating and reigniting their interest in your cause. If you haven't reached out to them to a while, you need to get them excited again about what you do. Again, if you just hit them right out of the gate with an ask, that might be a little off-putting. What have you been up to? What did you do with the money that they donated to you last year, right? Give them updates. They really want to know and they care. That's why they give. And then December, of course, that's the giving month, right? So definitely ask your followers uh, to support you and, and you know, give to, to your campaign, um, but also don't forget to spend time asking and thanking donors. So it's not just asking them to give, you know, what does that look like after they give? Um, what I love after I give on a campaign is not just a thank you, but hey, thank you so much. Uh, maybe it's in that email, thank you. There's a blurb telling me, hey, can you forward this to, to your friends and, and loved ones who you know, might wanna support too and help us hit our goal? That's a great opportunity. Um, it could be after they give on your website, you know, share on social media that you donated, right? Like give them opportunities, not just to thank them, but also to spread the word for you, right? Um, so again, if you download those free guides, they're gonna go really in depth about each month. This is just a high level overview to give you an idea of what you should be focusing on month to month. Um, also want to call out that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Giving Tuesday has lots of great toolkits for nonprofits. So if you're going to insert Giving Tuesday into your gear and campaign, check out their free resources. They have some really great toolkits, really great ideas, um, things that you can pull as inspo and apply it to your organization. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel coming up with all new concepts all of the time, right? Um, and then, so we're talking about Giving Tuesday. I like to use Giving Tuesday as that benchmark. So, you know, hey, we want to raise this much money by end of year. We want to raise half of that by Giving Tuesday. So on December 4th, after Giving Tuesday, you know, Giving Tuesday came and went. Thank everyone who supported you and provide a campaign update. Um, I like to prep two different pieces of messaging in advance. One for if we hit our Giving Tuesday goal, one if we didn't. Either way, there's still opportunities for supporters to help you. Um, so if you did hit your goal, amazing. You want to celebrate that. You want to make your supporters the hero. Wow, you helped us. We're so excited. Thank you. Thank you. And encourage them to share your campaign to hit your year end goal, right? And then if you didn't hit your goal, that's okay. It's okay to say thank you, but you know, we're a little bit behind. It's really, really important, um, you know, that we hit this goal. Tell them more about why it's important to your mission and what you do. Um, and again, you want to give them opportunities for either donors who have already supported you to share, and then you want to encourage people who haven't to give, right? So create opportunities and also say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've donated and I've been so surprised to not even get an email thanking me for the gift. Um, it could be as simple as after you give on your website, a thank you pops up on the screen, right? Thank you so much. Because of you, this is what we're going to be able to, to do next year, right? Um, so find ways to say thank you and create opportunities for support. So we've kind of talked about how to position Giving Tuesday. Um, next, let's talk about different ways to amplify your campaign. So if we're doing Giving Tuesday, that's typically more of a digital social media type holiday. So we're going to assume that we want people on your website. Um, so we need to get people there. How are you going to get them there in your year-end fundraising? There's a million different tactics. Um, I just pulled some of the most common ones that I see. There's direct mail, of course, um, email, organic social, but there's also paid social, which can be very lucrative if you know what you're doing. Uh, text messaging is great. People tend to check their text messages more often than email, so that can be a good way to break through the noise if you have opt-in and the capabilities for that. Peer-to-peer, um, -peer, definitely fits in for Giving Tuesday. We'll talk about some different ideas for that as well. Um, and then word of mouth, you know, your board members are talking about it, your volunteers are talking about it, you know, get people talking about the campaign that you have going on. 
Um, so on that note, if we're, if we're going to be doing online fundraising, it's really, really important uh, to take a look at your landing pages and your website. Where are you sending people to? Um, and the reason being 95% of first impressions about a brand or a nonprofit relates to website design. And that first impression happens within 50 milliseconds or less. So not even a second. Someone comes to your website instantaneously. They have an impression of you and what you do based on your site. Um, so it's really important if your website needs some love, now's a good time to start thinking about that. As Danny mentioned, we have the eBIC on QGIVS website that has some good tips. There's some free webinars on Achieve's website uh, about how to kind of rescue your website last minute. Um, if nothing else, if you don't have time for you know, a full website update, make sure your landing pages that you're sending people to um, are really well designed and have imagery and the donate form front and center, a uh, little bit of storytelling, right? You want to make sure that's a good first impression for people. Um, also, quick plug, if you need help with websites, um, that's a big thing that Achieve does. We work with hundreds of nonprofits around the country uh, for their website. So if you need help with web design, web support, we actually offer discounts for QGIVE customers. So feel free to go to AchieveCauses.com backslash QGIVE as a partner of them. Uh, we always want to support the nonprofits they work with as well. So if you need an emergency rescue on your website before year end giving, feel free to reach out. Um, we also do digital marketing and social media as well. So if you need any help, feel free to reach out. We're here for you. Um, but once you're, you're all set with your, your landing pages and, and you're good to go, as you start your year-end fundraising digitally, uh, there's three metrics I really want you to pay attention to. One is the number of web visitors you're getting. Uh, two, what's your conversion rate once they get to your website? And then three, what's your average online donation amount? Um, so on the side, here's sort of a hypothetical of last year, if we sent 10,000 people to the website and 2% of them converted and our average gift was $100, well, then we raised $20,000. Great. Um, so why do I want you to pay attention to that? Those are really the three ways you move the needle on increasing your, your online revenue. Um, and if you just do a little bit better in those categories, that can be big growth. In this example, if we just did 10% better than the year before, um, that's a 33% growth. So we're raising well above that 10% increased growth goal, right? Um, so you don't have to do a million things. It's just, okay, how, how, what's my baseline and what do I think I could do to do a little bit better, right? So we'll talk about different ways for each of those categories. So the first one, if you wanna get more people on your website, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can do a great content strategy. Um, maybe you build out a really great email series with a lot of storytelling this year in fundraising. Um, maybe you're going to leverage your organic social, your social channels, you see good engagement there, great, drive traffic to your site. Uh, maybe you are doing direct mail and you're including a QR code on that direct mail piece and a website in case people want to give online instead of writing a check. Not that you're still not going to get checks through that campaign, um, but more and more, I know even for me, when I get direct mail, if it's an organization that I give to regularly, I'm still going to go online, right? So make sure that's included on your direct mail for, for people that want to give that way. Um, maybe you work with a PR team and, and you get press. Great. Um, that's another opportunity to send people to your site. You can also optimize search. Um, so that could be SEO, thought leadership. If you have a Google ad grant that might be able to support you a little bit. I will say for year end giving, search is usually not the main driver. People aren't typically sitting down on Google, Googling, okay, how do I donate to this organization? Um, so usually your content strategy is going to be more important there, but search is a factor. Um, you can also leverage your net network. So peer-to-peer -peer strategic partnerships. Maybe you're going to do some paid social, some text messaging with your network, um, different things to drive people to your site. Um, and when we talk about email, another thing that can really help you is segmenting and automating your emails. So of course you have, if you can, divide out your email list instead of just sending it to everybody, divide them out by the type of donor that they are. Your active donors should be getting a really different message than your libunts and your cybunts. So libunts, if you, you haven't heard that term before, that's that they've given last year, but unfortunately not this year. Uh, cybunts is some year, but unfortunately not this year. So those 
those people that are LAPS donors, they probably need a little bit of extra communication with you for you to educate them about what you've been up to, uh, the impact that you've had, all those feel-good stories before you ask them compared to your active donors who are regularly in the mix, right? So you may want to think about setting up different email series for those different audiences. And then of course, you should be automating your thank you after they give. Um, so if you can, you can even put together a thank you series that, uh, that triggers, you know, if, if a live aunt gives on email number three, they don't get email number four and they just get the thank you, right? So think about ways that you can automize, automate to give your supporters a better experience, right? Um, if you're doing social media, take a look at your social channels that you're using. You know, what does your audience look like on each channel? Are your supporters there or does it vary? Is Facebook more of your supporters and Instagram is more your volunteers? You know, try to think about what are you trying to accomplish with each social channel and does that align? Um, and of course, this slide, the slide deck will be sent out to everybody. It's available. So I won't spend too much time on this, but I wanted to include some information about each channel as well. If you're not sure about your audience here, here's some high level data about the differences in each channel. Um, another thing to think about social media when you're creating your content, is it shareable? Um, so in this example, this is a sea turtle organization, we're giving really good advice about, you know, hey, did you only know that one out of every thousand hatchlings survives to adulthood? Here's ways that you can help ensure more survival of hatchlings. Um, if I care about sea turtle conservation and I'm following this channel, I'm likely to share that because I want my friends and family to know, hey, th these are things that you can do to help. You can take this same concept and apply it to your end giving. You can talk about the need and, you know, things that people can do. And then you can still include, you know, a call to action of, you know, hey, we have this goal. Will you help us and link to the website? Um, but if you really put the viewer in the front seat uh, of social media, instead of just talking about we do this, we think this, it's all about us. Um, people aren't going to want to share that content. Think about how you can create more shareable content to let other people talk about you on your behalf, right? Um, now, social media, I could talk for hours and hours about, um, but there's already two free webinars on QGIV that I've done in the past. One is social media one-on-one, -on -one, how to create the perfect content calendar. So if you're, you're new to social media, you don't even know where to start, that's a great one for you. Um, the second one available is Get Unstuck. That talks about if you're struggling with engagement, follower growth, or getting people to take action. There's some different tactics in there uh, to help you with that. So wherever you're at on your social media journey, if you need a little bit of help, definitely go check out these other webinars that might help you. Um, quick note on TikTok, if you're new to TikTok and it's overwhelming to you, TikTok has a really great free creative center where you can go at any time and you can see the hashtags, video, and music that's trending. Um, so same thing, if that's new to you and you need a little help and inspo, that's a great free resource. Um, now on meta products specifically, so talking about Facebook and Instagram, you might need to amplify with some paid spend. Um, why it is a pay to play game? The algorithm has really changed over the years. Typically only one to 5% of your Facebook followers even sees your content organically without paid spend. Um, so if you, you know, you're, you're putting out great social media content, but no one's seeing it, uh, maybe you need to invest for your year end fundraising campaign. Um, why does engagement matter so much? You know, talking about sea turtle conservation again, here's three different organizations. You can see the two on the right, they have huge followings. And at quick glance, you know, they're, oh, a couple hundred reactions, comments, shares, this is great. Yeah, but relative to how many people follow them, only 1% are engaging, less than 1%. What if 100,000 people were all paying attention to what this organization had to say, that would be a huge result, right? Um, so this example on the left is a sea turtle organization we've worked with, you know, 98% engagement rate based on their following. And that's, that's the power of paid spend. If you know what you're doing and you do it correctly, um, you can make a big difference. Um, if you're just taking, you know, if you don't have a big budget, maybe you only have $50, $100 a month, a really great first place you can go just for awareness building is an engagement campaign. So you would optimize your meta campaign for engagement. Um, I like to set up a whole month and then I just add all my different posts to that and I can turn them off and on depending on what, per what is performing well. Um, but there's tons of different ways to, to set this up. 
Um, Meta Blueprint has tons of free courses where you can learn anything and everything you've ever wanted to know about running ads. So if that's something of interest to you, definitely check that out. Um, or of course, you know, organizations like Achieve, we specialize in this. We do it all day long. We can help. I'm sure there's lots of other great agencies out there as well. Um, but if you're going to DIY, something to think about with your ad targeting, here's just an example. There's a hundred different ways to slice and dice your ad targeting. Um, but in this situation, you know, maybe we're targeting people 22 and up in our community. And then we want to target people who are familiar with you. So that means we're retargeting them from your website. So people who visited your website in the past 180 days, you can do that if you have a meta pixel on your site, it's a small piece of code. Um, you can also create audiences based on who's engaged with you. So people who've engaged with you on Facebook or on Instagram or who have liked your page on these channels. Um, you can upload your own email subscriber and donor list. So if you have, you know, big email subscriber list, put that into Meta and retarget those people. You can create lookalikes of them, right? Um, use that valuable data. So in this situation, we're targeting these people who are familiar with you, or maybe they aren't. So we're looking for new people. You can create lookalike audiences of all of this warm audience based on your data. So people that look like people who've been on your website, people who look like people who've engaged with you. Um, and so, so it's an and or here, right? Have affinity for causes similar to yours. You can add an interest-based targeting. So people that have shown interest in other nonprofits similar to you, uh, people who are interested in things related to your mission. Um, if you are, you know, a food bank, um, you know, maybe people who like other food banks, right? You can add that in as interest. Um, and then this is really where the magic happens for fundraising. They, they also and or also need to meet higher income bracket or net worth requirements. So you can say, I'm looking for people in the top 10% of income in my area. Uh, I'm looking for people with certain buying behaviors. Somebody who's buying a Jaguar has a different income potentially than somebody who's buying a used Honda, right? You can make these decisions to make sure the right people not just people who care about your mission, but people who can give to your mission um, are seeing your content. So some good tips there for meta advertising, but again, meta blueprint will teach you anything and everything you wanna know, um, or there's other organizations like Achieve that do this all day long. Uh, another thing to think about when you want to get people on your website is how can you leverage your people? Um, I always like to do media kits. That's a great thing that you can pass out to your board, your volunteers. It should have recommended copy for text messages, social media posts, emails. It should have a few different piece of graphics and photos that they can use. Make it really easy for your supporters to share your campaign. If you go to your board and you say, hey, can you share this on Giving Tuesday or make sure to shout us out on Giving Tuesday? They may not know how to do it, but you know as the marketer. So if you give them the media kit and teach them how to use it, you just made it so much easier for them to take action. Um, so that can be really helpful. Another one is Facebook fundraisers. If you have a Facebook fundraising account set up, you know, ask your board members, ask your volunteers, ask your Facebook followers, hey, on Giving Tuesday, will you set up a Facebook fundraiser on your behalf? Um, you're more likely to raise more funds with multiple Facebook fundraisers than you are with one. Um, another thing you can do is call banking. Can you write phone scripts for your staff or volunteers, a board? Maybe you have a committee to help you with this. Have people calling your supporters for your year end goal, getting them to pledge support leading up to Giving Tuesday to hit that goal, um, following up with them after the fact, right? There's lots of different ways to leverage your people. So we talked about ways to get more people on your website. Um, next, we wanna increase donation conversion rates. So how are you gonna do that? Again, lots of different ways to approach it. Uh, the easiest one that I find is make it easier to give. Make sure your website has a really quick, lo quick load time. Have clear call to actions. Make it mobile optimized. If someone's on Instagram and they're clicking through to your website, if your website's not mobile optimized, they're not gonna stick around and hang out, right? Um, you want a simple donation form. Maybe you're using text to give, um, have Facebook or Instagram donations enabled, not to replace your online fundraising, but it's one extra place if people want to give on Instagram instead. Great, let them. Um, so, so make it easy to give. You also want to make sure you have compelling content. So it shouldn't just be a block of text on your giving page. Have some imagery, have a video. Maybe it's some animation or an impact story, something that's really going to drive home, you know, why do we want to help 30 kids succeed in school this year, right? 
Um, and then you want to make it tangible. So again, we're not just saying, hey, we want to raise $30,000. It's we want to help 30 kids uh, highlight the problem and the solution and make sure you have clear goals that people can quickly understand. All of those things are going to help increase your donation conversion rates. Um, another thing you can do is A-B test your landing pages. If you have the luxury, test out a couple different ones. When you're in that October soft launch phase and you're testing different messages, different emails, people clicking through, maybe you want to A-B test and have one email set go to one landing page and one go to another and see which one does better. Um, then refine that, right, as you go into your November and December giving. Um, this was an example where we did that and we found out that when you have a small image, a few quick blurbs about the need and then a quick little uh, outline of, hey, you know, we have a matching gift, so everything doubles by the state. Um, when we kept a little bit of content on the side and then the form on the right, that converted better than when the form was lower on the page. That makes sense. It converted better than a page with a whole big long story. Uh, people probably got overwhelmed with all the text on, on the story version. Uh, so the quick highlights version worked for us, but every organization is different. So A-B test what you're doing if you can for your landing pages. Um, we've already talked about making it easy to donate. This is another example of, you know, you can add donate buttons on Facebook and Instagram so people can give to you. 30 days out from Giving Tuesday, you could create a fundraiser, right, and start linking to it for people on Facebook. Um, it's not that we want people to give on Facebook instead of on your website. It's just one extra place. These three examples weren't even fundraising campaigns. These were simply, you know, just posts where we added a button because it was relevant to the content. And in each scenario, a few people gave some money that we wouldn't have gotten any other way. Um, so make it easy to donate. If you don't have a Facebook donation account, this is how you can go set it up. The, the URL is here. It's very easy to do. Um, if you had it before and it disappeared, that could be part of the change that happened last October. Meta partnered with PayPal Giving Fund for donation processing. Um, so if you had one, you disappeared, you don't know what happened to it, you probably need to go to this URL at the bottom, Nonprofit Manager, and just connect your PayPal account to that to get your, your Facebook donation account back. Uh, once you have a Facebook donation account, you can also unlock Instagram giving tools. Uh, this example on the left, this is my cat. This is where I rescued her from. Every year on her gotcha day, I throw up an Instagram story about her with a donate button. Every year, a few of my friends give just because they know me and that's my cat, right? Um, let other people be able to, do to donate on or fundraise on your behalf. Um, you can also have a support button on your page as well on your Instagram profiles. If somebody does want to give right then and there, they don't want to go to the link in bio and click through to your website. Okay, great. We're just happy that they're giving, right? Um, now, one thing to, to mention on Facebook fundraisers, it's not going to cure all that ails you. The average Facebook fundraiser gets four gifts and they're about $34. So even as an organization, if you're going to set up one for Giving Tuesday, that's great, but it's going to be way more impactful if you can get a, an army of people, whether it's your volunteers, your board, whoever, your staff, to set up a Giving Tuesday Facebook fundraiser, you're more likely to get more in the collective than you are with just one standalone Facebook fundraiser. Um, if you are on TikTok, there are ways to get donation uh, buttons there. There's a breakdown here. It will be on the, the deck that will be sent to you. Same thing for YouTube giving. There is an option, but you do need to have at least 10,000 YouTube subscribers, which I find a lot of organizations don't. So just a call out there. It may not work for you, but if you have over 10,000, definitely something to explore. Um, and again, when, when you're talking about conversion, it's also important to think about why are people giving? They, they recognize a problem, you're solving it, they want to make a difference by solving it with you. So all of that should be in your messaging. What's in it for them, right? Um, and then if you're, you're entering into the peer-to-peer -peer arena, something to think about too is peer-to-peer is -peer can be fun. It doesn't have to just be people asking their friends and family to donate to a cause they care about. Um, this is a really great example from a humane society in Georgia that I just donated to. Why? One of my coworkers, her cat, is in this photo contest. Um, and how the photo contest works is every dollar equals one vote. So if you want to vote, you pay some money and you vote to get your favorite pet uh, to move up 
up to this contest. Um, so I thought that was very clever and it's fun. It's competition, you know, with all the pet owners are into it. Their friends and family think it's cute and funny. Um, so Clear Up Here doesn't have to just be, hey, give. You can add a competitive element or something to gamify it and make it fun. Um, and again, these are just ideas, you know, take and leave the ones that work for you. Um, lastly, we want to make sure we're increasing average online donation amounts. So you can do that through your donation form. You can lower your processing fees. I know with QGIVE, most of the time for organizations we work with on QGIVE, most of the time their donors are covering the processing fees. That's going to help increase your online donation amount if you were paying a fixed processing fee prior. Um, maybe it's recurring gifts or you have a thermometer so people can see, oh, we're almost at that Giving Tuesday mark. You know, I, I can make a difference. I want to give. Um, you also want to engage your donors. What's the impact? Are you giving them updates that they care about? Um, are you asking them to share the campaign as part of your thank you message? So when someone gives, hey, can you, you spread the word for me? Um, and then your giving tiers as well make a difference. I always like to attach impact to the giving tier. So really good example of that when we're talking about 30 kids, I don't have 20, 50, 100 as my basic you know, giving tiers. I'm equating each dollar amount to impact and you'll see they're sort of weird dollar amounts. And what was really interesting with this campaign was a lot of people that would normally give at the $50 level well, they didn't want to do $42 because that's less than they plan to give. But when they saw, oh, for $84, it's a month of after school care, I'll just bump up. And most people did, right? So if you make it tangible and you give them a reason, that can help increase uh, your donation amount. Um, another thing to think about is your giving tiers should reflect your average gift size. If your average donation size is $200, your giving tier shouldn't be $25, $50, $100, right? So take a look at your own data and decide what makes sense based on what you know from the past. Um, and then also you can get really creative. You know, maybe you're throwing in some extras to, to encourage people to give. I saw this from a Las Vegas rescue on Instagram the other day. Uh, for $20, one of their volunteer artists will send you a portrait of your pet. Um, and right in the marketing messaging, you know, possibly, probably poorly drawn animals. So they're not promising some big work of art. It's just a fun, engaging way to give, right? So can you add some extras if somebody gives is it a certain tier? Uh, can you think of something clever to give them that doesn't even cost you a lot of money necessarily? These are just volunteer artists, right? Um, so lots of different ways to get people on your site, increase conversions when they get there and improve the, you know, bump up how much they're giving. Um, but how do you know if it's working? Well, you should be tracking where your web traffic and conversions are coming from. So Google Analytics, everything switched over to GA4 last year. If you haven't switched over, do so right away. Why? You're going to want to make tracking links with Google URL Campaign Builder. So you can go into your Google Analytics and see, okay, you know, 20% of my web traffic to my donate page came from social media. 50 of it percent came from email. So much came from direct mail. You want to know what's working, what's getting people there and what's converting. Um, and then if you're using, you know, Meta for advertising or LinkedIn, you should definitely have a Meta Pixel and a LinkedIn Insight tag set up. Um, Google Tag Manager can also help you if you have, you know, Google ad campaigns and different things running that you need to differentiate. So you definitely need to be tracking where your traffic's coming from. If you've never used Campaign URL Builder by Google, it's really easy. Um, you could just Google it and it'll pop right up, but you put whatever URL you wanna drive someone to, and then you're gonna add your source, your medium, and your campaign name. So for this example, we'll say it's coming from social, it's gonna be my traffic, so social media, and then it's a cost per click campaign. So I'll say CPC, but you could say post instead if it was a post. Um, the biggest thing here, your campaign name, you want it to be the same across the board. So when you're looking at your Google Analytics, you can look at, you know, all of the results from that campaign. So in this example, we'll say Giving Tuesday 2024, but it can be anything you want as long as it's all unified and it's something you'll know what it is. Um, and then you also... You, you can shorten that link as well right in there. So it'll it'll push out this big, long tracking link. You can either copy it and use it in your email or whatever. But if you need a shortened version for social, 
you can go ahead and, and do that as well. Um, so if you haven't used it before, definitely check it out. Um, that's really helpful. Um, another thing that happens I found is sometimes your website has tracking limitations. Lots of nonprofits, you're using a donate processor that links out outside of your website. Um, so maybe you're not going to be able to track that conversion traditionally in Google. So an example of that would be, so I maybe I clicked a tracking link and I landed on your website. Now I clicked a call to action button to donate. It's driving me outside of the website and then I'm donating there. So Google Analytics knows that there was a transaction, but it's only equating it back to my website, not the original source URL. Um, so what do you do about that? Now there's a gap in your tracking. There's lots of ways to approach it, but I find one of the easiest ways is if you can set up different uh, donation forms and separate landing pages. So that way I know form A, the only way somebody got to that was they clicked on a social ad and they landed on that landing page and made a conversion. So I know that that was a social transaction. Uh, maybe I have a different one for direct mail and for email. You know, there's lots of ways to work around it, but I find that that's one of the easiest ways to set up separate forms and landing pages for each channel that you want to track. So you, to, just to give you trends, it's still not going to be a perfect science. Um, but might give you some insight into what's working. Um, and then don't be afraid to test and learn. Um, consumer behavior changes really quickly, especially social media, for example, that changes constantly. Um, so you might map out this really beautiful, well thought out year end fundraising strategy. And by November, you're testing different messaging and you go, oh no, this isn't working. We need to totally change how we're approaching this. That's okay. If, if you're spending a lot of time on email marketing and you're not getting conversion there, maybe you want to dial that back and spend more time on something that's working, right? So test and learn and see what the data is telling you. Um, if you can, at least once a month, hopefully more often, but if not, at least once a month, I like to put an hour on my calendar to take time to analyze results. What's working? What is it? Go into Google Analytics. Where is my traffic coming from? Where are my conversions coming from? Use this data to make decisions about what you do next. Don't just, okay, we came up with this plan, so this is what we're going to do. No, use your data and adjust, right? Um, and then finally, one last thought to address the elephant in the room. Uh, you're not a robot, right? You're a human being. You can't be everything to everyone. Your own fundraising can be a lot to take on. Um, really just control what you can and let the rest go. Do, do what you can and give yourself grace because uh, we're all wearing a lot of different hats doing the best we can. Um, so again, if you want to download some of those free year end fundraising planners or the guide, check out AchieveCauses.com. There's tons of free resources there to help you. Um, anything from digital marketing, social media, web design, web support, we've got you covered. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Awesome. Thanks so much, Erica. Before everyone starts to leave, I'm going to launch a quick poll in case you want to receive more information from Erica and from Achieve. You can opt in there. You might have already done this on the registration form, but we'll just give you this second opportunity. Let me launch that for everyone. I know we do have, there we go. I can Sorry, already see one screen. question from Christine asked, what was the site for uh, shortened upload uh, URLs? Um, you can use Bitly for that um, or the URL campaign builder on Google um, has it built in. So when you're making that tracking link, if you check a little box, you can get the shortened link right there. So Bitly or URL campaign builder with Google. Fantastic. I've got a few more questions for you. If we don't get to anyone's questions today, please do reach out to Erica. Her email is listed on the slides, um, and I know it's been dropped in the chat a couple of times, but an attendee asked, can you give some examples on how to fundraise for an urgent need versus utilizing a story and what this can look like? Yeah, so you're still going to have a story, um, but a really good example could be, you know, hey, maybe you didn't get a grant renewed that you've been relying on for years and years for a specific program. And so, you know, hey, we have this big goal. We, no kidding, need to raise $50,000 by the end of the year to keep this program going. I think it's okay to tell that story. I hear often sometimes people get nervous about that because, oh, well, that turn off, you know, donors. We don't want them to think that we you know, aren't doing a good job or something. Um, I think it's as long as you're presenting that message truthfully, but but also, you know, 
not downplaying all of the great work that you're also doing, talking about how big of an impact you've had and how important these programs are across the board. I think it's still okay to say, you know, hey, things have changed. We really need this money to support this program. So in that case, you're going to tell a lot of stories about what that urgent need is. Um, whereas the storytelling component, you're you're creating a story based off of what your ask is, right? So the example of 30 kids in school, <clears throat> that organization does all kinds of things. They help parents, they help um, immigrant families coming over, all kinds of things. The, the child care component was just one part of what they do. Um, but we picked on that because we had a lot of data from the past that showed when we talked about that program, we saw a really good response. And we knew that $1,000 per kid pays for their after school for a year that really helps with their literacy rates. So we built a whole story around that need, um, even though they do lots of things, because sometimes when you're fundraising for everything, it could be a little overwhelming to a donor, you know, you do a lot. Um, so telling a story that can resonate and become more personal, telling real stories about the kids that you're serving in that example uh, was more impactful. Absolutely. Um Another question, do you recommend sending people to your website's homepage or the donation page directly? Always the donation page directly um, or, or a landing page if you want them to learn more about something. Um, if you just send them straight to your website, I think that's okay. You know, if you're building on an email and you have your logo at the top, maybe that logo link does link out to your homepage, but your call to actions and everything within your email should definitely be going to the donate page. Awesome. Or a landing page that's relevant to what you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is a longer question. Um, does sure. engagement on social media equal an increase in donations? I have heard conflicting data on social media's effectiveness on leading to philanthropy. I see studies showing that people give because they feel connected to a cause, but also see studies that show social media is lowering personal connection slash feeling of belonging. Yeah, so one of the biggest things that I do at Achieve is raise money through social media. So it definitely can be done. Um, a lot of times when we're doing fundraising is through cost per click advertising with social media. Um, you're kind of talking about two different things. So your day-to-day -day posting and engagement, that's more your brand awareness, staying top of mind with your supporters. That's a really important channel uh, or, or tool, I guess. Um, you should definitely be providing people updates calling out partners in the community and sponsors and tagging them, giving them updates about what you're doing day to day. Um, but where I find the real magic happens for fundraising is through cost per click because you're using your that data, you're putting income parameters on it, you're being really thoughtful about who you're targeting and why. Um, and then you can also test a lot of messaging in real time, you know, really to make that work. It's a lot of A-B testing and a lot of the ad management, not just coming up with the creative for the cost per click. Um, so I know it works. We do all the tracking and there's lots of great ROI for the organizations we work with there. Um, but there's sort of two different things. So engagement's good. You need to focus on that. That's sort of your long-term investment that you're doing all the time, giving people updates. If you have strong engagement there, that typically does translate really well to fundraising when you do do those cost per click campaigns. Um, but even if you don't have strong engagement, but you're planning to do cost per click, well, then you're going to need to invest in the engagement side because somebody may be getting an ad and they want to vet you. So they're going to go to your social channels and see what you've been posting. Uh, so they're hand in hand. It's not really an either or. Awesome. And then do you have to have pay a PayPal account to accept Facebook donations? I think you do, but I'm yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then how often would you say we can send emails per week during the end of year campaign? Uh, how often can you send emails? Yes. So a lot of that really depends on your data. Um, I know everyone's always really afraid to email too often because of donor fatigue. I find donor fatigue happens more when you're hitting somebody with the same message over and over and you're not connecting with them. So it's not so much about frequency, it's about quality, right? Like if you're sending me some impact updates, you know, maybe once a month in November or every other month in November, and then you start to ask me to give in December, that's a different equation than if you've just been saying, we need you to donate, we need you to donate for weeks and weeks on end. Um, so 
think about your messaging there um, for the donor fatigue side. But, you know, also I like to point to what's going on in the for-profit world. I come from for-profit. I used to do luxury hotel marketing. Um, you know, hotels, Marriott, I'm a Marriott Bonvoy person. They email me constantly to book a vacation, right? Sephora, I like Sephora. They email me like every three days, right? Um, so I think it's okay to, to communicate more. It's just how are you communicating and what are you looking to get out of it? So in that planning phase, you know, what's the purpose of each piece of collateral that you're putting out? Is it awareness? Is it telling them a story so that they're ready to give when you ask, et cetera? Absolutely. Do you frequently work with clients who kind of increase that frequency at least a little bit around the giving season? Absolutely. Um, and I will say too, if you're an organization, like maybe you don't have a regular email newsletter and you haven't really communicated with your donors since last year, you need to think about that this year, because if you haven't talked to them for months and all of a sudden you're hitting them for money, there's a disconnect there. Like, whoa, we're not, I'm not connected to you like that. Right. Why should I care? Um, so if you haven't been doing that work, you know, October, November, those are really good times to start talking about the stories. So that way, when you hit December, people feel like they know you again and what you're doing and they want to support you. Absolutely. I know we're coming up on the end of the hour um, and I don't think we got to everyone's questions today. So again, I will heavily encourage you to reach out to Erica if there's anything um, that we missed today, or if you're going through the slides um, after the webinar tomorrow and you would like to answer some other questions, um, please reach out to either of us. Um, we're always happy to answer your questions. Erica, thank you so much for taking the time. You had so much wonderful information to share and thank you for taking on the burden of understanding the ins and outs of social media, because as you said, it is <laughs> always changing and it is very overwhelming for a lot of people. So we really appreciate you um, laying it all out for everyone. Yeah, it is. And if you if you know social media is somewhere that you need some help with, definitely check out those free webinars that are already on QGIVS website that I've done in the past. Um, or feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm happy to hop on, you know, a 15, 20 minute call, talk to you, give you some free advice. Um, you know, we definitely like to practice practice what we preach and achieve. We we like to support the nonprofits we serve. So happy to help. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you everyone so much for taking time out of your busy days. I know with giving season just around the corner, I'm sure everyone's getting really busy about this time of year, trying to get everything prepared. So thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye.